angle kind of soft when the time's coming. Hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Noor Fahmi. I'm a data scientist at Hashtag Paid. I'll be one of the hosts for the session today, as well as Royal Square, who is a data scientist at Ada. Um, if you guys haven't heard of us, uh, we are stream owners at ACE. ACE is a community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in AI research, engineering, and products. We host free live sessions like this three to five times a week and produce premium content in various subject areas. To see more, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. We currently have 14 different streams that are focused on various ML topics, and this session is in both Math and Foundations as well as NLP. Hope you enjoy it and come back. Today, we have Gary Huang, who is a machine learning scientist at Layer 6, presenting um, less is more. So without further ado, start us off. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Huang from uh, Layer 6 AI. And today, I'll be presenting our research paper, Improving Transformer Model Through Better Initialization, focusing on optimizing the transformer model in the field of neural machine translation. This paper is co-authored by Dr. Felipe Perez, Dr. Maximus Volkovs, and uh, Professor Jimmy Ba from the Vector Institute. So uh, a bit of a background in machine translation first. As the name suggests, machine translation is part of natural language processing that, st that studies the automatic translation of one language to another. Research in this field originated in the 1950s, and the mainstream focus of research has shifted from a rule-based system to a statistical-based system, and to today's uh, neural network-based system, where the most famous and widely used example is probably Google Translate. I mean, uh, for, for one, I use it uh, on a daily basis. Uh, for those interested in the business side of things, uh, multiple sources, sources have estimated the global market size of machine translation to reach close to 1 billion by the year 2022. So that's a sizable market. Um, proposed in 2017 by Google, the neural, the neural network architecture called Transformer has been one of the most popular neural machine translation models in recent years, which we show here on the right. 
Upon its proposal, the transformer model, along with some of its uh, derivative models, such as BERT, renewed several state-of-the-art scores in the field of natural language processing. Since then, there have been a lot of papers studying it and a lot of applications based on its uh, model structure. The most famous one is, again, Google Translate. For the purpose of this talk, there are three things to notice about this structure. One is that it follows a encoder-decoder structure. Uh, there is a stack of, stack of n transformer layers on the left-hand side here. Collectively, we call it the encoder. The input to this model is processed by the encoder into an intermediate piece named the memory. The remaining part of the model, called the decoder, uses the memory to extract outputs that ideally should match the target translation. The model depth n is a uh, hyperparameter that can be varied. From a general machine learning pr perspective, the larger the n, the deeper the model, the more parameters it has, and then uh, the more powerful and accurate it should be. At least uh, that is what one typically expects. Two is that uh, it can be noticed that both the encoder and decoder follow somewhat of a ResNet-like structure. There's a residual connection that goes through the entire encoder or decoder. And both uh, multi-head attention blocks and MLP blocks serve as residual blocks around these, six, six, around these uh, skip connections. The third point is that there are a lot of layer normalization blocks placed on the backbone of the encoder and decoder, one after every skip connection. For those that are not familiar with it, layer normalization, as the name suggests, performs a normalizing operation on its inputs, resetting the magnitude back to 1. The main difference between norm, layer norm and uh, what we probably know better, batch norm, which is more commonly used in the field of computer vision, is that batch norm normalizes across channels, while layer norm normalizes across uh, input samples. As powerful as the model is, after taking a closer look at its details, we found several problems that were not answered by the original paper or subsequent papers. For example, in contrast to, intuit to intuition in the uh, machine learning society, it is very difficult to train deep transformer models beyond certain depth. Why was there such a uh, such limitation when common, th common theme in most other models is the deeper the model, the better the performance? Also notice is that the training of transformer has the unique requirement of a warm-up period, ramping up the learning rate initially from a close to zero value toward the peak value, then follow the common decay, decay scheme. This particular scheduling is mandatory mainly in transformers and its deriv derivative models. Many researchers have suggested various reasons for the necessity of this warm-up phase from different angles. For example, in the uh, rectified atom optimizer paper, it is suggested that learning rate warm-up is a way of, to buy time for the atom optimizer to collect enough samples for low variance estimate of the in inverse of the second moment of the gradient. This argument, however, could not explain why other models optimized with atom does not have a similar requirement. Uh, we plot the magnitude histogram of both the gradient and up atom updates for the encoder embedding layers of a transformer model during the first 100 steps of training, with warm-up in the top row and without warm-up in the bottom row. So you can see here, there is a clear indication that without warm-up, the error signal back prop propagated toward the embedding layer completely vanishes within merely 20 steps. Similar phenomena were observed, were observed for the other parameters in lower layers as well. Considering that the purpose of having residual connections around these attention layers is precisely to facilitate error signal backpropagation, back this conflict drew our attention. We then realized that the root cause of this vanishing gradient problem is precisely the layer norms placed on the backbone, which now seems very intuitive considering these are the only things standing in the way between the loss function's uh, error source and the embedding layer. Deriving backpropagation equations across the layer norm functions, it can be seen that the backprop magnitude is inversely proportional to the magnitude of layer norm inputs. Combining these results, we now have a complete picture of why training vanilla transformers without warm-up fails. The large variance in the atom optimizer, amplified by the large initial learning rate, leads to large updates at the beginning of training due to lack of samples. Large updates, in turn, increase the magnitude of inputs to layer normalization. 
uh, we plot the LT norms of inputs to layer norms after each uh, self-attention layers in the decoder during training with and without warm-up. Clearly, we can see that when the initial learning rate is large, magnitudes of inputs to layer norms grow quickly in the first few steps, and in some layers, tripling the initial magnitude very fast. This snuffs out the information backpropagation pathway downwards, leading to vanishing gradients for parameters in the lower layers, especially the embedding layers. Vanishing gradients then further destabilizes the atom updates. And this cycle continues until there is enough history to stabilize the optimizer, but by that time, the model is already stuck in a bad plateau. Now that we know the necessity of warm-up comes from a combination of layer norm and atom optimizer, there are different ways of tackling this problem. One approach aims at, uh, our approach aims at solving the root of the problem, removing layer norms from the architecture altogether. For this, we need to understand the role of layer normalizations in transform. Analyzing the flow of information, we see that without layer norms, the typical initialization parameters leads to magnitudes along the residual backbone increasing indefinitely with the network depth, which means that any updates to the parameter will also cause a perturbation uh, to the eventual output that is amplified through the model, affecting the output in an un undesirably large way. Layer norms are placed on the residual backbone to precisely counter this effect, resetting the magnitude back to one after every layer. If, the, however, the uh, parameters can be initialized in such a way that the magnitude along the residual backbone grows in a controlled manner, then layer norms can be completely removed from the architecture without any drawbacks. Typical initialization algorithms, such as uh, Xavier initialization, focuses on the preservation of local variances, not the global one. But a design scaling on top of that can accommodate our need. The goal of such scaling is to control the total change in the transformer output after gradient update which leads to constraints on output magnitudes of each residual blocks. In a transformer with L total layers, this constrains each layer's output to the order of one over L. For MLP blocks, the fixed up initialization does the job. Uh, in our main theorem, we showed how this can be done for attention blocks in, tra in the transformer architecture. Combining the, the derived magnitude constraints, we arrive at our uh, proposed T fixed up initialization scheme. All parameters are initialized as in the vanilla transformer model. Then the embedding layer parameters, as well as decoder parameters, are scaled by an additional factor condition on the total layer number. Encoder parameters are scaled by a slightly different factor due to the asymmetry that encoder outputs was used as input to the decoder attention layers. It might seem that, and, and that's it, right? It might seem that our t fix up algorithm is pretty simple and straightforward, and in a way it is. Despite its uh, simplicity, we shall see its power through some results on machine translation tasks. To show the power of our, of our initialization, we compare t fixed up initialized transformer models against leading models on multiple public machine translation datasets, including IWSL T14 German to English, English to German, WMT17 English to German, and the low resource dataset WMT18 Finnish to English. Several observations can be made from this table. We see that the uh, pre-layer norm tends to hurt model performances, particularly for the big ones, as observed in several literatures. The original fix-up algorithm performs comparably to the baseline. However, it does require additional tweaks to the structure, adding scaling layers, bias layers, and zeroing out some weights. Rectified atom optimizer removes warm-up by just replacing atom and the performance comparably to the baseline. Finally, we can see that TFX of, uh, initialization perform, outperforms all baselines on uh, each data set. The performance is particularly strong on the WMT17 English German data set with the base configuration, outperforming the baseline by nearly two blue points. These results indicate that by using our simple initialization, we can effectively remove both layer norm and warm up and still achieve leading performances, indicating that tailoring weights initialization to the, to the specific structure of the transformer is indeed beneficial. Going back to the histogram plots, we add the uh, gradient and the atom updates histograms of T-fixed models trained without warm-up to the bottom row. 
Because there is no warm up, atom updates are large from the beginning of training. But since layer norm is removed, large updates no longer leads to vanishing gradients, keeping both atom updates and the gradients stable throughout training. The trend in transformer model is that increase in depth generally leads to better results. However, training deeper transformer models, as we uh, discussed before, have been uh, proven to be challenging. And in many of the published architectures for neural machine translation have fewer than 10 layers. Several methods have been uh, proposed to enable training of deep transformer networks, including the previously mentioned pre-layer norm transformer, the LCL, DS initialization, and the Lipschitz restricted initialization. To fairly compare to these uh, previous methods, we trained on WMT14 English to German dataset, as well as WMT17 English to German dataset, with comparable numbers of layers in t of models. We first see that increase in depth does improve, improve, does improve performance, as all deep models outperform the six-layer baseline by over one point. We also see that our t of models outperform all other models of comparable depth. Notably, on WMT17, t up with six layers uh, performs comparably to pre-layer norm with 20 layers and DLCL with 25 layers. t up with 20 layers outperforms the DLCL pre-layer norm setting with 30 layers. Similar results can be observed on WMT14 dataset. Together, these comparisons cover the majority of published results to date with deep transformer models and demonstrate the effectiveness of t up To uh, further investigate whether we can train very deep models, we, slightly incre we significantly increase the depth to 200 layers in both encoder and decoder, thus reaching 400 layers and over 1,000 attention and MLP blocks in total. To fit model of such depth on a GPU, we reduce the uh, model configuration to embedding dimension of 64, MLP layer head and size of 128, and two attention heads. So obviously, these are just to demonstrate on a very deep model. It's not looking for uh, state-of-the-art performances. As stated before, to uh, build such uh, a deep transformer model, we simply stack the layers, remove layer norm and warm up, apply T fix up initialization, and that's it. No other modifications are done. We train these models on uh, IWSL T14 English to German dataset, show the uh, validation curves and blue score after 50,000 uh, training steps as depth is increased from 6 to 200 layers. We see that all models were, success were successfully trained and have a smooth uh, validation curve. Beyond 50 layers, we observe some overfitting due to small size of the data set and the small size of the model. But uh, all models achieve reasonable blue score considering the reduced dimensions and shortened training durations, showing no indication of divergence or other optimization problems. These results further support the conclusion that our initialization can be successfully used to train very deep transformer models opening up avenues for future research, researchers in this area. Last but not least, it is known that warm-up plays an important role for transformers to train in large batch sizes. It is therefore concerning whether a large batch training can still be applied with t up removing, removing the entire warm-up phase. So here, we test on both standard and deep transformer models with the WMT base architecture on WMT17 English to German dataset, and show that with t fix up applied, it is indeed possible to train with large batch sizes without warm up and without any significant decrease in performance. So, to summarize, we present an investigation into optimization challenges in transformer training and show that the requirement for learning rate warm up comes from the stability, the instability in the atom optimizer combined with vanishing gradients across layer norm normalization blocks. We then propose a new weight initialization scheme named the t up with theoretical guarantee that keeps model updates bounded and allows to remove both the warm up and the layer normalization. Experiments on machine translation benchmarks show that t up enables training of ultra deep transformers while achieving leading results. Future work involving testing the application of T-fix up initializations in transformer derivative models, as well as deriving analogous initialization schemes for other related architecture. 
so at the end, we would like to acknowledge that this work is being funded by uh, is funded by the MyTax Accelerate program and was done with the support from the Vector Institute and the Computer Science Department at the University of Toronto. And uh, with that, I end my presentation. Thank you for your time, and uh, I am ready to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Kerry, for such a great presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the paper, and I like the fact that you know you uh, find this the the problem lies in uh, the atom optimizer with layer normalization. You show it theoretically and. Uh, and also come up with a novel initialization that completely, you know, removes uh, layer norm and uh, learning rate warm up, and still does extremely, I mean, pretty well uh, in the NMP data set. So I have a few questions. So one question that that I had uh, is, what does T fix up stand for? Like, is it a transformer fix up or? Yeah. So um, as uh, I have mentioned in the paper and briefly in the presentation, the idea of Fix up, which stands for a fixed update, is actually not our is not our new idea. Uh, it does come with a previous paper called the fix up initialization, that uh, implements this idea on ResNest structure. Uh, we uh, we adopted that idea and uh, tailored it against the transformer architecture. So yes, the T stands for transformer, and the T fix up is transformer fix up. I see. And uh, what is the story behind T fix up? Did you? Not specifically want to train like deep, you know, uh, transformer models for your own work, or was this out of research interest that that you decided to pursue this problem? Uh, yes, uh, funny story. Uh, because uh, I started this project when I was interning at Layer Six uh, as a part of the uh, computer, uh, University of Toronto's uh, MSCAC program. Mm -hmm. so for that internship, we need a academic supervisor, and my supervisor is uh, Professor Jimmy Ba from a Vector Institute. So he, him being the author of layer normalization, uh, was asking the question of why does why is layer norm needed in transformer? For example, why not bash norm, right? So we actually started the research by looking into why the necessity of layer norm in transformer and why is there, why does bash norm not work? Can we get rid of it? And uh, halfway through, we realized that oh, transformer. Uh, other than this layer norm problem, transformer has other issues. For example, warm up. For example, uh, you can only train uh, sh relatively shallow ones. So uh, we start investigating into all these problems. And uh, interesting enough, they all converge back into <laughs> the uh, no layer normalization blocks. It's it's quite interesting because I found it amusing too because. Jimmy Ba, uh, Professor Jimmy Ba is uh, also the author behind Adam and Layer Norm, and yeah. uh, and then it seems like the problem comes down to you know those those two areas uh, in in the T fix up as you mentioned in the T fix up problem, and yeah, I found it pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, I and I think it's precisely because he is the author of these two things that he he is more I don't know. Um, he, he has a better feeling of asking the right question of, for example, why is layer norm needed in there, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think there were a few audience questions to um, know to you. No, sir, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, yeah, there have been questions in the audience, but uh, Felipe Perez, who is one of the co-authors of this paper, has been able to answer most of them. Um, but one of them was, could you explain the intuition behind deciding the initialization scheme? Uh, could you say it again? Uh, could you explain the intuition behind deciding the sizes of the layers in T-fixup? Right. So the intuition is that you want to control the the magnitude or the uh, effective magnitude on the output. And uh, first of all, there is no way of, uh, without layer normalization, it's very hard to constrain it back to one because you're adding, piling onto this mainstream, the, the backbone, right? But the, then the intuition is that maybe we don't need to restrict it back to one. We just need to constrain it to a, to a fixed update, for example, uh, with the mainstream, uh, the backbone starting with magnitude of one and L layers, maybe we can just scale it so that each layer adds one over L. After L layers, you add a fixed magnitude on top of the backbone. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what we're doing with T-Fix. Awesome. Um, Avilash also asks, um, theoretically, shouldn't residual connections compensate for the vanishing gradient problem due to layer normalization and atom instability? 
Uh, sorry, my audio is not very clear. Could you, could you ask again? Yeah, for sure. Um, theoretically, shouldn't residual connections compensate for the vanishing gra um, gradient problem due to layer normalization and atom instability? Uh, right. So the problem is exactly that uh, in the vanilla transformer architecture, the rest, the residual condition is not enough to uh, compensate for that because you have one layer norm after every layer on on that backbone. And uh, as we have presented, uh, it is indeed the layer norms on the back propagation process that's that's shrinking these error signals. So yeah. Um, <laughs> One way is obviously to move the layer norms uh, off the backbone, and that's is, that is precisely what uh, pre-layer norm does. And uh, if you look into it, pre-layer pre-layer norm setup does have a very clean backbone and does allow training of deep uh, transformers. The only issue is that it doesn't do as well. So yeah. I had a similar question when you were talking about pre uh, LN. What about um, you know? Did you try SGD? Uh, with layer normalization too, and like just replacing Adam with SGD, and and how did that work? Yes, indeed. So, like we said, uh, the problem is not only layer norm, but the interaction between layer norm blocks and the Adam optimizer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, once we realized this, the obvious answer is, can we try some different optimizer? And the the, the first uh, answer that came to mind is SGD, and we did try that. And uh, interestingly enough, with training with with SGD, we actually don't need necessarily need a warm up phase. Uh, you can just uh, go start up as a very high learner and train. It trains, but the problem is that it doesn't converge to a very, as nice point as Adam does. So uh, to sum up, SGD can train without warm up. It just doesn't do as well. I see. And uh, another maybe a uh, slightly different question is: I think in recent years there have been like sort of two kinds of approaches to like you know training neural networks. There is the structural approach. And then there is the the uh, parameter initialization approach, like like you have explored in TFixup. So, do, what group do you belong to? Do you uh, you know do you basically agree with uh, more like um, initialization approaches, or do you see more of a structural approach to, to these problems? Right. Uh, so my take was actually I do agree that structure is probably important aspect and uh, we're probably not exploring enough in that field oh, i mean although we have papers like uh lottery ticket hypothesis and stuff um i do believe that the true answer lies somewhere in between for example uh we have been achieving uh, achieving great uh performances with uh parameter optimization folks uh, directions but mm -hmm. obviously that's not enough but then again obviously it is doing something so i do feel that the uh, final answer of uh, training transform or training uh, neural networks in general is that you need to optimize the parameters, but also you need to focus on finding probably better structures or even dynamically evolving structures. So maybe like uh, such as uh, with the uh, neural architecture search and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's that's an interesting point. So do you think, with respect to T fix up? Uh, we could add something like a DLCL layer uh, that you know that might improve the performance. Like that's sort of a combination of both structure and uh, parameter updates. Yeah, that's definitely one way to go because as we probably recognize, like transformer is probably not the ultimate uh, neural network architecture. Um, there is always uh, uh, architecture changes on top of it that can make it better, mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, with that change, we probably need better uh, or more uh, correctly designed uh, scaling schemes, initialization schemes for that new architecture. So yeah. Sounds good. We have one more question from the audience. Um, you said that the uh, IT does not work very well for very large batch sizes. After what batch size does the T fix up kind of break? Uh, could you say it again? Uh, batch size, what? <laughs> yeah. Um, after what batch size does the T fix up break? Uh, we haven't tested to that extreme just because it's very uh, computational intensive. We tested up to eight times of the, of the um, original batch size. And so far, T fix up hasn't break. And larger ones will take more uh, GPUs than we have. And that's why we stopped uh, testing there. So that sort of relates to one other question I had, which is, uh, so the T-fix-up approach is specifically for transformers, right? And uh, 
and you have mentioned this in the paper too that now we can try high learning rate like you know large batch sizes and and converge faster do you think we could use similar approaches for um, other architectures do you do you and i think you sort of briefly alluded to this in your future work but do you have any ideas uh, with respect to that um, yeah so my, my take on this is that definitely for example and and here's the thing uh, for our research, we looked into the uh, fixed double initialization paper. That was a essentially a global parameter initialization scheme designed for ResNet, right. and that would have been great. I don't know. On the transformer structure, T fixed up is similarly a globally designed uh, parameter initialization scheme for transformers, and that was doing well, great as we our paper has showed. I do believe that uh, when we are building different. A neural network architecture, we typically use initialization such as Xavier or Kyming or some other initialization schemes. But one thing that I noted was that these are mainly designed to preserve, as we, uh, as I have presented, but it's mainly designed to preserve the local variance mm -hmm. across like uh, local, for example, MLP layers. But mm -hmm. then that's not the only thing, right? Uh, as we have seen here, especially in uh, structures such as like a ResNet, the global variance also matters. So for others, for example, maybe CNN, maybe LSTM, LSTM even, uh, maybe there are uh, better global initialization schemes that could improve uh, performance a lot. Mm. I don't know. Um, this is my intuition. Oh, okay. And of course, part of the future research that we can go into. And, and also, I think the other question I had is, did you explore any other data sets apart from um, or other tasks apart from your machine translation? Or uh, maybe uh, it's not in the ICML paper, but like uh, on the side, did you did you explore any, any other data sets as well? Um, not too much. We just focus, we may, in this research, we mainly focus on the machine translation data sets, uh, partly because uh, we we need to do a lot of repeated experiments on these, and the other thing is that I say how has a deadline, right? So, <laughs> yeah. No, were there any other questions from the audience? Uh, no, that would be it. Uh, I had I think one last question, and uh, so do you? What are some of the like? Do you know if there are any weaknesses with respect to T fix up? Like, are there any limitations uh, uh, that you know we may not have discussed so far? Right, so uh, with tfixup, it replaced the, uh, norm, the layer norm blocks, which is a scheme of normalization, with a uh, designed uh, initialization scheme. So uh, our feeling was that uh, even though it works, it is probably a bit sensitive to hyperparameter tuning, just uh, precisely because you're, you remove that uh, layer of uh, regularization. So uh, especially with uh, in extreme conditions, for example, super large data sets, super large models, super large batch size even, uh, you might be more sensitive to uh, hyperparameter tuning. I don't think it will break with the correct hyperparameters, but it might get more fragile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, that answers all my questions. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gary. Uh, no, if we don't have any questions, maybe. Perfect. Well, once again, I'd like to thank Gary for joining us today. Um, Royal, thank you for facilitating this talk. And for you guys, if you would like to see more free content like this, visit ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other sessions and many more. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, ML Papers Explained, to get notified about all the live sessions and other free content we publish. Thank you guys for joining us. We'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye.